All right, let us get started. So, um, today we are going to finish up the stuff we were discussing with regards to BERT. We're going to look at how to use BERT for different NLP tasks. So we talked about sentiment analysis last time as an example of a text classification task. We're going to talk about pairwise text classification tasks where you have two inputs. And we're also going to talk about uh, a particular kind of question answering task and how we can use BERT to solve um, these kinds of tasks. At the end, we will look at how to, uh, or some more advanced variants of BERT that came out after um, it was released and some specific issues with BERT that each of these tried to address. So, uh, like 10 minutes ago, I added four optional readings for this class on these advanced variants of BERT. Of course, I don't expect any of you to have done them because I just put them up. But if you're interested in any of the stuff we discuss in this class, um, please see those papers for more details. Uh, before we get started, um, about deadlines and stuff. So your proposals are due on Friday. You have a quiz that's also due on Friday. Um, and homework one, we are wrapping it up, so that will go out next week. Um, and we'll have to see about homework two uh, when, when that might be. As far as a midterm, someone asked about when the midterm date is. Um, we're tentatively planning for er early November, so either the first or second week of November. Um, one of those weeks, I will be gone for a conference, so we're probably going to do it then. As far as logistics for the midterm, even though this is a somewhat in-person class, um, I think we're going to do the same as we did for the previous completely remote class where we will release the midterm. You will have 24 to 48 hours to complete it. Um, it'll be fully open internet and open books so you can look up whatever you want um, and submit it on Gradescope. So hopefully it'll be um, not as stressful and um, there are not, not as many health concerns as having all of you in this classroom uh, taking the midterm. All right, so any uh, other questions before we get started? All right, um, so uh, one person asked first on Piazza about, again, the definition of a downstream task. So I just wanted to quickly clarify the whole transfer learning setup and what is the difference between a pre-training task and a, a downstream task. So let's start with. So at a high level, um, when we're using things like BERT or ELMO, there are basically two phases of training. So the first phase, um, we might have the pre-training task. Oh, whoops, why did I have it in the past tense? Right, so this is what we discussed last time. We mask out some token in the input sentence. This gets passed through an enormous transformer. Um, and then we get these vectors at the output of um, the, the model, right? It goes through all of these self-attention blocks, these transformer blocks. At the end, I get one vector uh, for every token in the input sequence. And for the token that corresponds to the mask, sorry, for the vector that corresponds to the mask token, I want to predict its ground truth identity. So in this case, in our example, it was open, right? Um, so this whole thing is the pre-training task. And in BERT, this is a masked language model. In ELMO, we had the forward and backward language models. But the key insight is that we don't actually care about this task in particular, right? 
there's no practical application, well, debatably, of like masking out some word in some sentence and then asking the model to predict what that is. We care about these more real world tasks like sentiment analysis or question answering, right? These are the things that companies want to solve or researchers want to improve or so on. So we take this BERT model that has been trained, or sorry, pre-trained on this mass language modeling objective. And our goal is to repurpose this model for an actual task that we care about. So one difference between the pre-training task and the downstream task is that for pre-training, we typically have as much data as we want, right? This is a self-supervised task where we get labels for free. I can arbitrarily mask out any words in any text and then feed that into BERT. I can't do that with sentiment analysis, right? Someone needs to tell me what the sentiment of these sentences or paragraphs is. So I have a smaller number of labeled examples for the task. So in our example, we had like this movie was good, is good. And you know, I, we, we're gonna talk about this part of this lecture, like how do we exactly make this thing predict positive? Um, but but the, the main insights here are that first we're transferring this pre-trained model to solve this supervised task, right? So this BERT model here, we're going to initialize our sentiment model with the pre-trained model's parameters, and then we're going to fine tune the parameters of our BERT model using the sentiment signal as um, uh, for the for the fine tuning. So we'll we'll also cover this terminology of pre-train, fine tune, freeze, and what what all of that means. But for whoever asked about what is a downstream task, I don't know why I'm doing this. That's that's cool. Um, this is our downstream task. And this is just one example, right? We care about sentiment analysis. We want to get a good sentiment analysis model, but maybe we can't get a good sentiment model just from our labeled sentiment data. And so we're relying on transfer learning with this pre-trained model to give the model some knowledge of like just general purpose, how language works and so on. So it doesn't need to learn all of that from the downstream sentiment data. So hopefully that clarifies um, all right, so now I want to talk about this side because we talked last class about the pre-training side where we mask out these tokens and predict them. It's pretty straightforward uh, extension of just the left to right language model that we discussed uh, at length this semester. So let's get started with that. Um, Applying BERT for text classification. And sentiment analysis is one example of a text class classification task. There are many other things that you might be interested in, for example, emotion classification, or if your inputs are questions, what type of questions are they? You could do topic classification, given a document, which of these topics is the most, uh, is it expressing? Many different things, um, but sentiment analysis is a like canonical example. So there are a couple of special things about BERT that I haven't talked about thus far, and one thing is its input format. So in this example up here, I've just said the input to this um, this model is the raw text of the sentiment sentence, but in BERT we actually add a special token to this in order to um, applied to classification. So in BERT, we're going to prepend a special classifier token, or in the paper, they call it a CLS token. So it's a special token, just like the mask token that we saw during pre-training. Um, and then we add the uh, text of our sentence. And so now this uh, CLS token This is a special token 
used for classification tasks. So this whole thing, and the CLS token is also included during pre-training. Um, if you read the BERT paper, you'll have seen that they actually apply a separate objective to train the CLS representation. Um, the paper that has been assigned for optional reading today, which is an improvement on BERT called Roberta, gets rid of that um, CLS specific objective. So it's not very important to understand what exactly that they were doing in the original BERT paper. You can just say that, all right, for every single input to BERT, we're going to prepend a special token. It might not be used for anything during pre-training, but we're going to use it for uh, downstream tasks. And here's one example. So of course I have vectors for all these things. I pass them into my BERT model. And remember that this BERT model is a pre-trained model. So I've already done the mask language modeling training. This is not initialized from scratch. This is initialized with the output of this, uh, this thing over here, the, the left side over here. So that's a key difference. If I wanted to train BERT from scratch just on my sentiment data, I wouldn't have anywhere near the amount of data or my, and my signal is not expressive enough to actually learn all of these interesting properties that I, that I want. So um, you can look at, look at the paper to see you know, what, is the, what difference does a pre-training actually make? What difference does pre-training with mask language modeling make versus other sorts of self-supervised tasks? Um, and we talked about you know, all the advantages of mask language modeling versus left to right language modeling in terms of how um, easy it, it makes it to have a single model architecture instead of multiple forward, backward things and so on. Anyway, so when I have BERT, right, this is gonna give me a vector at the final layer of BERT. And the original BERT paper was released with two different model sizes. There was BERT base, which was a 12 layer transformer. Um, and each of these vectors was, I think, 768 dimensions. Um, and there's BERT large, which was 24 uh, layers. So BERT large being larger also happened to perform better um, by a little bit on all of the tasks, all of the downstream tasks that, that they evaluated their model on. Um, anyway, so I get all of these vectors, right? And so during pre-training, I would look at the vector that corresponds to a mask token, and I would apply a softmax layer on that to predict the ground truth identity of that word, right? Um, in this case, I have no mask tokens, right? In the sentiment example, there's no point in me masking tokens such as losing information about the input. So what I want to do is predict the sentiment of this sentence. Um, and it, the, the question becomes, which of these vectors do I choose to place a softmax layer over to predict the um, label of the sentence? So there are many ways you could think about doing this, right? The, the way that the BERT authors chose to do it is always pick the CLS vector and place a softmax layer over this vector to predict positive in this case. Um, so this is how the authors of the BERT paper choose to do this. You could do different things, right? I could just get rid of the CLS token. I could possibly average the uh, final layer vectors of all of the tokens and then pass that through a softmax layer. Or I could for, uh, do something like in the ELMO paper and put an additional model over these final um, BERT outputs that is trained with the sentiment um, signal to um, predict the label. But one of the advantages of this BERT formulation is that we don't need to add, we only need to add a very small number of parameters, new parameters to this model, right? In this case, we're only learning one new matrix the, that goes with this new softmax layer. Um, remember in ELMO that we had a whole nother task specific model that was solving the task. Here, these parameters are uh, trained from scratch. 
So that means we randomly initialize them, then we fine tune them using this um, uh, sentiment objective. The parameters of BERT, however, are fine tuned. So we initialize these parameters with the pre trained model, and then we do back propagation from the softmax layer all the way down into the CLS vector, all the way down into this BERT um, model, and then all the way down into the eventually the token embeddings. So um, if you imagine BERT is 24 layers, I'm fine tuning all of those layers with the signal from my sentiment um, model. So parameters fine tuned through task okay. downstream task signal. And one of the goals of the uh, BERT paper was to minimize the number of parameters that you're training from scratch um, with your downstream data. So this is the minimal thing I can do, right? All I'm doing is adding a single classification layer on top of this model. Everything else is uh, initialized with the pre-trained model and then fine-tuned. So you can think of fine-tuning as the pre-trained BERT model has learned a lot of stuff about language more generally, but it may not know that much about sentiment classification, the specific task. However, it's encoded a lot of information about sentiment in its pre-training process, right? It might have seen, for instance, sentences from reviews, and it's been trained on those sentences through the mask language modeling objective. It might understand the meaning of good versus bad, uh, or great versus good, the different intensities and so on, but it just needs to kind of be specialized to solve this one task that we care about. So the parameters don't need to be adjusted all that much. Um, and in the original BERT paper, they only fine tuned this model for I think three epochs, which is three passes through the downstream data set. So that's, that's not a lot. Um, in follow-up papers, people show that you can fine-tune this model for like hundreds of epochs and it does a little better, but um, it's not like the parameters are changing a huge amount from the pre-trained model. Uh, so uh, you can think of it that way, like the fine-tuning process specializes the model to a particular task. Um, and the pre-trained model is more general purpose, it's capable of solving multiple tasks provided you fine-tune the model on those tasks. All right, any questions? Yeah, so the question is, um, why don't we additionally use the MLM objective on the task-specific data, like the sentiment data? So we can have two signals. We can have predict positive, and also we can mask out some of these things and have the model predict. And uh, people actually do do this. Um, they do it in the context of BERT and also with these left to right language models. Uh, it's called things like language model fine tuning and so on. Um, it, it can be helpful when, you're, when your data set is on a very different domain than the pre-training data. So if I have like legal documents for instance, maybe BERT didn't see a lot of those during its pre-training phase. Um, so maybe I want to fine tune first with the mask language modeling on the unlabeled legal documents and then on this. So it's commonly done in sequence, but you can also do it um, together, I guess. Um, I can share some papers later on that, uh, that go through this, this process, but that's a good thought. What specifically do you use here? Like, what is the algorithm that is involved in just So the question is, why are we using the CLS over just averaging the, the word embeddings and then, oh, sorry, the final layer embeddings? And uh, I don't have a satisfying answer. This is just a empirical decision. It's also kind of easier to, because conceptually you can think of, if I want to get a representation for a sentence, I'll just take this vector, extract it from the output of BERT, and I don't have to do any additional um, processing. But I agree, I mean, you could, averaging is not that, that complicated anyway. Um, I imagine they tried it and found that this was better. Also in the original BERT paper, they thought that this classifier token needed to have its own training objective. So there's some other um, 
kind of smaller things there, but yes. Uh, you mean during pre-training? Yeah, so the question is, during pre-training, what is the second objective for the CLS token? Um, so basically, in and this is just an aside, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but in, in BERT, the pre-training, you would have something like CLS, uh, and then let's say the students open their books, opened, and then I would have a special separator token, and I would give it another sentence um, or segment of text, uh, and then maybe this one was, then they started the exam or something. And so the pre-training objective it was given this input um, from the CLS token, predict whether the first sentence, let's say S1, um, precedes S2 or not. So I could select a completely random sentence for S2 and put this um, uh, into BERT, and then the CLS token should predict that S2 is not the sentence that uh, follows S1. So this was called next sentence prediction. You can uh, read more about it in the BERT paper. Um, one of the models that we'll talk about later on in this class, hopefully, is called Roberta, and they just eliminate this objective from the training of BERT and find that it's not necessary, actually. So you don't even need the separate training objective over the CLS token to make this work. But originally, the thought was, let's just have some arbitrary classification task that requires the model to encode information about the entire input into the CLS token. Okay. The question is, is the CLS token different for different classification tasks? No, the CLS token is a specific word type in the vocabulary. It's the same for any um, downstream task. It's not special. All right, uh, hang on, let me look at the YouTube. Okay, got some questions. Do the word embeddings come from a static dictionary or are w English words fed into the upstream BERT model to derive the embeddings? Um, so the word embeddings, um, so sorry, for up till this point we've only been talking about word embeddings. The word embeddings that come into BERT, they are, uh, they come from, I guess you could call it a static dictionary in the sense that we have specific word embeddings for each of these different word types in the vocabulary. Um, in BERT, we're using subwords, actually. I don't know if I understood the question properly. Is 768 in BERT the dimensionality of the output vectors? Yeah, so the output of every transformer block is 768 dimensions. Uh, sorry, every token representation that's output from a transformer block. Like image classification, can we freeze most of the layers in BERT and fine tune only the last few layers while fine tuning? Yes, you can do this. I think they actually do this ablation in the BERT paper. So they show you what happens if you, for instance, freeze the BERT model and only use the uh, final layers as you would an ELMO as input to the, actually they just put a softmax layer directly over those things without any fine tuning. I believe this is in the original BERT paper, but you should, you should check it out. They find that fine tuning has slightly better performance. However, if you want to maximize efficiency, um, so you don't want to fine tune the whole model, you can certainly cache the output of the pre-trained BERT model and then train a classifier over it so you don't have to deal with backpropping into this giant model. Uh, what would be the output of movie? Um, this is where I would love to have seen this question in real time. Uh, where does movie occur? <laughs> Okay, here, uh, I assume the question is what is going on over here? Um, the answer is nothing. We don't have any task specific um, classifier layer or anything over the uh, tokens representations that are not the CLS layer. Can BERT be used for machine translation? No, um, BERT cannot generate text, at least not this model that we've talked about now. Um, it can, of course, infill text, so if you give it 
some words that are missing from some input, it can predict those, but um, there are other issues with this that we'll, we'll get to later. All right, let's go back to this uh, and continue. Um, you can hold your question till, till later. So what do I want to talk about next? Um, right, so let's just review the terminology that we've discussed because I keep saying these words and I want you to make sure you understand them properly. Is that how you spell terminology? Yeah. So one thing I've been saying a lot is pre-train. Uh, who can tell me the definition of pre-train? Yeah, so more specifically, I start with a randomly initialized model. And I train it using a self-supervised objective. Um, and we've talked about two different self supervised objectives so far. We've talked about language modeling and mask language modeling. And one of the important characteristics of this is that uh, data is free, right? So I can just create a ton of instances of mask language modeling or language modeling by getting arbitrary amounts of text. Um, and this means I can train big models on big data sets. And the goal, remember, pre-training is just to learn um, a good representation of uh, arbitrary text. Um, so it should pick up important linguistic phenomena, should learn syntax, semantics to some extent. Um, this is our goal with pre-training. So another thing I'm, I've been saying, uh, specifically when we were talking about ELMO is the idea of freezing a model, right? So here, this refers to the fact that we do not backprop into the parameters of the pre-trained model using the downstream Um, training objective. So in ELMO we kept our language model parameters fixed and we learned a separate model on top of them. In BERT we are not keeping anything frozen in this model, right? So we have a new classifier um, layer that we're training from scratch and then we have the entire BERT model that we're fine-tuning. Um, so can someone tell me Intuitively, why might I want to freeze parameters of a model? Yeah, so, so that's right. He said, if we have very few labeled examples, then um, chaining the parameters of a language model might not be a good idea if it has a huge number of parameters because we have just a very tiny amount of data, so that might be a biased sample. It might uh, do what's called catastrophic forgetting, where the model overfits on this small labeled data set and forgets all the useful stuff that it learned from the pre-training phase. So we would like to balance that, right? We kind of want the model to change a little bit, but not a lot, and we don't want for it to forget any of the important pre-training information it learned. All right, and finally, the last bit of terminology we talked about was fine-tuning. This is essentially just the opposite of freezing. We backprop into the pre-trained model using specific signals. All right, so any final questions? 
Oh, I see. So the question is, when we talk about transfer learning, do we always use fine tuning or do we always use freezing? Uh, both of these can be used in the context of transfer learning. In either, either case, I'm using the pr uh, model that results from pre-training to help me solve the downstream task. It's just a matter of, do I change the parameters of that model or not? So both of these can be used in a transfer setting. So Elmo and Bert are both examples of transfer learning. Can you even partially freeze? Yeah, so the question is, can you do partial freezing? You can. Uh, I think this is much more popular in computer vision, where you can actually tell to some extent what each layer is focusing on. In NLP, it's not as clear, so people generally don't do that. Although there have, if you search, you can find papers that do this, but any gains are just very small and probably not significant. Um, all right. So uh, let's move on to a slightly more complicated task. Um, not really, but um, just to introduce you all to more NLP tasks than just um, sentiment analysis. So probably the next easiest thing to understand is sentence pair classification. So there is a lot of sentence pair classification tasks in NLP. Um, one of the most popular ones is uh, natural language inference. Um, you might also hear this referred to as uh, textual entailment. And the task is essentially given two sentences Let's say S1 and S2. Does S2, and there are three possible labels here. Does S2 entail um, S1? Does S2 contradict S1? Or are the two centered sentences neutral? Um, so for example, let's... Uh, Let's have sentence one be the dog walks and sentence two be the dog sits still. So these two are in contradiction. I mean, of course this task is, is a little vague because you have to assume that the dog in both of the sentences is the same dog for this to actually be a contradiction and that these actions are happening at the same time, but that's kind of how the the task is framed. So um, it's very similar in many ways to a paraphrase identification. Given two sentences, do they mean the same thing or not? This is a slightly more specialized version. Um, if you're interested in this task, uh, there are uh, many large scale data sets for this. The mo most popular ones are SNLI, the Stanford Natural Language Inference data set, and MNLI, which is a um, larger, more diverse collection of these sentence pairs. Um, I think these have hundreds of thousands of labeled examples. They were created through crowdsourcing, which we'll, we'll talk about later in the semester. Um, this is a very popular uh, NLP task. So let's say we want to solve this task. We were given these two sentences, the dog walks, the dog is sitting still. And we're asking Bert to figure out, is, do they, does sentence two entail sentence one, or does it contradict sentence one, or is there no relation between these? So this is a three-way um, text classification problem, the way I've described. So how would I set this up? Well, I'll start with my CLS token. As before, I'll put in the first sentence, the dog walks. I will now use another special token, the separator token, or SEP, which is going to distinguish the boundary at which sentence one ends and sentence two begins. Um, up here, I talked about the separator token and its use in um, BERT's pre-training. Again, you can read the paper if you're interested, but it doesn't really matter. It doesn't have to have its own um, use. Uh, Anyway, so it's a special token, and then the next one is the dog sits still. 
And so this is my input now. So you can see I've concatenated both of the sentences with using the separator token. And now, of course, I will just feed all these things into BERT. And what, what happens is uh, uh, in my output, my final layer will give me all these vectors over here. But just like in the single sentence classification case, I only care about my CLS vector. And I'm just going to put a softmax layer over this to predict contradiction. So um, everything is basically identical. The only new thing we've added here is the separator token. Um, and we have two sentences instead of one, but this task is done in a single um, forward pass of the model, right? We don't have to encode each sentence with a separate pass of bird and then do some other, other stuff. Um, okay, so does this make sense? Um, I don't know if I properly understood the question, but I guess the last part of what you said was how do we uh, introduce new separator tokens if for whatever reason we want the model to be able to use different separator tokens. The reason for which is not very clear to, to me, but maybe you want to know that, um, I don't know, this is the first time a separator has been used and this is the second time, but remember that we, all of these inputs have position embeddings associated with them too. So even if you use the same separator token multiple times in an input, um, they will, their representations will be different from each other due to the added position embedding. But I guess there's a more general question, which is if I want to add a new vocabulary item into BERT for my downstream task, how do I do that? You can do this, um, but it's kind of uh, like you can, the simplest case is just add a new item to your vocabulary, like add a new word embedding. The problem is that hasn't been pre-trained before, right? So it would just be a random embedding, which you could fine tune through the task specific signal. Um, maybe it would work, but uh, it's a little strange. I, I don't think people really do this, this kind of thing. Yeah. So the question is, why do we need the positional embedding to be composed with a separator token? Uh, I mean, if, if you have one separator token, you probably don't need it. I was referring specifically to this case where you might have multiple separator tokens. But even then, I mean, the broader question of why do you need position embeddings should be clear, right? Um, the separator token is just there in case punctuation alone doesn't distinguish the boundary clearly between these. So for example, if these were two documents, right? You might have multiple sentences in each one and then you have to clearly demarcate where one ends and the other begins. It's kind of easy when you always have two sentences and it, you might think, why do you even need this? But in more complicated cases, you, you probably do. So, so if you have three separator tokens or whatever in your input and you don't add position embeddings, the, remember that the model has no idea without the position embeddings where in that document they are. So um, it might be able to know, for instance, that you know, document two's tokens are all within this certain range, but adding this explicit separator token makes it much easier for the model to figure it out. Um, all right, so let's... Let's move on. Um.
actually. Okay, message retracted, nice. All right. So uh, what are we doing next? Oh yeah, so we'll, let's move on to a more complicated task. Um, so Bert for question answering. We're gonna be looking at a specific type of question answering which is called extractive question answering. And this means that um, my input is a question, a passage, uh, sorry, and a passage. Um, and the goal, uh, predict a contiguous span of text from the passage that answers the question. So examples of this kind of um, thing, the most popular and famous one is called Squad. This is a, a Stanford question answering data set. It has a lot of examples of this kind of um, extractive question answering. You might also see it called reading comprehension or machine reading and things like that. Um, there are other data sets that extend this setup to different kinds of uh, cases. So one that I worked on is called Quack. There's one called Coca. There are many other uh, people have probably made hundreds of these data sets at this point. But they all have the same form. Like you have some passage, you have a question, you in most cases know that the answer is located somewhere in the, the passage. So this makes this task kind of unrealistic, right? If you always know that the question is answerable, then the model doesn't have to actually model the contents of that passage in, um, in much depth. It's much more challenging to figure out if the question even can or can't be answered from the passage in the first place. So we'll talk more about um, more complicated QA setups later, but uh, this is the, the simplest, um, and because it's so simple, it has kind of led to a lot of uh, different machine learning models that have been built and um, kind of trained on this data set and shown that they're better than others and so on. Uh, if you look, if you Google Squad and look at its leaderboard, you'll see there's been hundreds of different models submitted that claim to solve um, Squad. BERT, when it was, so ELMO, when it was released, was number one on that leaderboard and quickly replaced by BERT, which was quickly replaced with the Roberta and all these other things that we may or may not talk about at the end of the class. So let's take a specific example. Maybe um, our question is who starred in the matrix? And we have a passage that's like, has a bunch of words and then says Keanu Reeves and then has you know many many more words and so the model is asked to of course produce Keanu Reeves but it's not generating this text it's merely finding the location of Keanu Reeves in the passage and returning the indices of that location so if this was position I and this was position J, um, we would return the span IJ of the passage, which is the answer. All right, so how do we go about using BERT to solve this problem? So this is a little more interesting than the simple classification tasks that we've talked about to this point, but it's not too much more interesting, sadly. Um, so as before, we'll get started with our special CLS token, then we'll add the question who starred in matrix. We'll add our separator token, and then we'll add all of the passage. So this could be T1, T2. These are all just words of the passage, T sub I, T4, and then maybe we get to Keanu Reeves. And then we have some other tokens, T6 and so on. So the sequence here could be pretty long depending on how long this passage is. Um, 
as we'll talk about later, BERT was pre-trained with sequences of 512 tokens. Um, there are other variants of BERT that kind of look to extend this, uh, this uh, maximum sequence length. And when we start talking about more efficient language models, we'll talk about uh, models that extend this way beyond 512 to like uh, almost 10,000 tokens, but we're not there yet. So this all gets fed into BERT. And of course, with BERT, I'm going to just get a vector out for every single token in my input. We don't actually care about all of these um, things. We start to care about the tokens only in the passage. So remember, our goal is to find the span in the passage that corresponds to the correct answer. So maybe I'll draw these in orange. Let's say I have all these vectors. Why did I draw so many of these? One, two, three, four, five, six. All right, so I have all these vectors. And um, the way in which we solve this problem is we have two binary classifiers. Um, one predicts the whether a token is the start of an answer. And then other predicts the end of the answer. And unlike all the previous applications, the downstream paths that we saw, this, in this case, the classifier will be applied over multiple token representations, not just the CLS vector. In fact, we're not using the CLS vector at all in this task. So let's say that uh, we'll use, I don't know, blue for this one and Red for this one. So on top of every one of the token representations that correspond to the passage, I'm going to train this classifier, the start of answer classifier, to predict zero. So zero means it's not the start of the answer. Uh, so P1 through P4, all of those were not the answer. And then we get to Keanu and we will predict that this token is actually the start of the answer. And then all of the other tokens are zeros, so they're not the answer. Then we have the same class, the, sorry, the second classifier, which predicts the end of this sequence, the answer sequence. Again, this is going to be zero everywhere except here where it is one at reads. So during training, I apply the same classifier. Um, in, you know, so I have one separate weight matrix per beginning of token and end of token. So I have two different parameters here that I'm learning from scratch. Um, and during training, I use these labels to train my model. It assumes that I know the location of the ground truth answer, which I do during training, right? Uh, squad has a hundred thousand of these passage question pairs with the labeled span locations. Is that clear? Now, what? Uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so this is what I was going to get to next. Um, so the question is when you're actually using this model on some held out question passage pair. How do you ensure that the spans that it predicts as the answer are valid, meaning the start of span is always before the end of span and so on? So that gets to the broader question of how, so let's say I train this model. How do I actually use it at test time to extract the, the answer span? Um, the way in which we do this is, so let me write this out, how to select um, answer at test time. So what we want to do is find the span, uh, let's say P i to J that maximizes 
this probability of p, oh, I guess p is confusing. Um, that's annoying. Maybe I'll call our first classifier start. Um, so start sub i is the probability of token i being the start of the answer, and sub j is the probability of token j being the answer. And going back to your question, how do I actually find a span that's valid? Because possibly start sub, so i could be greater than j in this case, and that somehow maximizes the, this uh, product. So what we do is we search through all possible spans that are valid, meaning that i is less than j, and also that because we know in squad, for instance, all answers are shorter than some amount, so we don't have to search every possible span. We can instead search for all valid spans up to some length. So this becomes kind of tractable. Um, but yeah, that's a good question. We are putting in our own inductive bias into our test time algorithm to, because we know what a valid spin looks like to constrain the search space. All right, any questions? Yes. Sorry, I can't hear. So the question is, instead of having these two separate classifiers, can we just have one that says, is this in the answer or not? Uh, I think test time usage for that becomes more challenging, though, because now you have, for every token, some probability of it being the answer. I guess you would want to search all valid spins and then see like the, the one that has the highest product of this like in answer or not. Perhaps you could do it this way. Um, there might be some downsides. I don't know. Oh, that's a good point. So the question is, well, I don't know if this is a question, but <laughs> part of what you just said was, what if there are multiple spins in the passage that correspond to the answer? So in squad, they were the annotators were asked to mark a single span that refer, that that is the answer. Of course, the span could be duplicated. So maybe this article contains multiple mentions of Keanu Reeves. Um, but we have the exact indices that the annotator marked so we can train this, this model. But yeah, that's a big weakness of a model like this, right? Um, so we'll talk later on in the semester about more complex QA models that actually treat this as a generative task where instead of selecting the span of text from some given passage, a model might get a question, it might be forced to retrieve passages that are relevant to the question, so we don't even get this passage at uh, training time, and then it's asked to generate an answer which could be multiple sentences long even. So there are far more complex um, QA formulations. All right, let me quickly check on YouTube. Uh, oh, this is uh, directly related to what I was just saying. Is there an IR component, so an information retrieval component in short form question answering, since the model doesn't have to piece together information from multiple documents? So there are versions of squad even that people have um, kind of modified to have a retrieval component. So for example, I could make this task just given a question and not the passage, have the model first have to perform a retrieval step to find the relevant passage, and then have the span extraction thing to find the answer from that passage. So many people have done this. This is in the line of open domain question answering where you don't know the, the um, relevant passage beforehand. Um, and yeah, you, you can look up some stuff like this. Actually, there's work called DRQA. Um, that um, lays this out. Also, is question answering using knowledge inferred from the passage a different kind of problem? So yeah, um, in this case, the answer may not be in the passage, but it may require you to infer or make inferences from information in the passage. There's a lot of generative QA tasks that are, that are like this, but yeah, it's a different kind of problem. All right, let's go back. I'm actually doing not bad on time, surprisingly. Um, okay, so the next, yes. 
So rather than doing it, so it's just doing it in France. Can you do something like Windows in a way where first we look at what the start token, we just we do the video for the first we look at what the matching, what the token is that the matching mm -hmm. block is at the start taken, and then we pick that and we only look at the tokens after that, and we fix uh, we fix the answer length, and then we only look at tokens up to only those number of tokens after the start length. So the, the question is, instead of doing this and searching through all of these possible spins, can we do it in maybe two steps where we first just pick the token that has the highest start probability and then search all subsequent tokens for which has the highest end probability? Yeah, but this is, this is not a great solution because, uh, for example, what if I had multiple actors mentioned here like Keanu Reeves and Lawrence Fishburne, for example, the model somehow thinks Lawrence has the highest start probability, but it also has high probability for Keanu, just slightly less. And perhaps uh, if I did what you said, I would never explore this Keanu Reeves span uh, anymore. I mean, of course, there are many other examples of this that you could give, but doing what you said means the model has to be really good at the start um, answer predictor. It doesn't really consider, you know, what if I uh, pick that token, but there's no token later on that has a high end probability, right? Then maybe I didn't pick the right start token to begin with. So um, that's that's kind of why you need to. So I think also that question is, can you do the insert or similar things like uh, selectively actually have identified certain five or six uh, start tokens? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yeah. And then do the insert and then carry on the. Yeah, so the question is, can you do a search instead of? enumerating all possible spin. For the size of the passage, uh, of uh, the average squad passage, which is only like four to five sentences, and the answers are always small, um, you, don't, you can actually do the full enumeration. But for very long passages where answers might be much longer, you probably need to do what you uh, suggested. Yeah. OK, let us uh, continue then. Now we're going to switch gears. We've completed, um, you know, actually several classes of tasks which are popular in NLP. Now we'll switch to um, advanced, well, that's kind of deep, uh, variants of BERT. Um, last semester that I taught this, I had a whole separate class on these variants, but um, now that BERT itself is um, kind of being replaced with other classes of models, I decided to just lump it into the, the end of this lecture. So there are a couple of different um, improvements on BERT that people have made. So one is uh, training improvements. Um, sorry, I should say pre-training improvements. Uh, and these improvements could be simplifications like um, getting rid of this next seg segment or next sequence prediction task. Um, also, the simplest but most effective improvement is just more data, more pre-training data. And these were the main contributions of Roberta, um, which is like Facebook's response to BERT. Um, Next, we have longer sequences during pre-training. Uh, so BERT has a maximum sequence length of 512 tokens. Um, we can use some clever methods to go beyond that. So one of the important papers in this regard was the Transformer XL. Uh, this was a model architecture. The BERT equivalent of this is called XLNet, I think. Um, a more interesting uh, change was a more efficient training objective. Sorry, every time I say training, I mean to say pre-training. So we'll probably spend most time on this. Um, and this paper is called Electra. And finally, smaller models. So you can do some clever stuff with sharing parameters across different layers to really get the um, number of total parameters in the model down. Um, 
This one is called Albert. So as you can see, very creative naming um, for most of these models. Uh, let's go over Roberta first. Um, as a default, like if you can choose which of these pre-trained models to use, and you're interested in using a BERT type model, um, in most cases you should probably use the Roberta base or Roberta large model and not use the original BERT models because Roberta has the same model size but it's been pre-trained on a lot uh, bigger data set and generally works better on most um, downstream tasks. So, Roberta simple collection of modifications. And uh, modification one was simply train with bigger batches. This is just a hyperparameter that you can change, right? And so I've been saying throughout this class, you should just maximize the batch size based on whatever GPU that you can get. Uh, this paper showed that it's actually important during pre-training. Pre-training with a bigger batch size leads to better performance on downstream tasks. So um, basically you have a smaller total number of batches, but a larger batch size. So if you control for the total number of examples that the model sees, it's better to have fewer batches but a larger batch size than have many uh, smaller batches. Um, and you can also do a trick called gradient accumulation to simulate a much larger batch size even if you have a GPU memory restriction. So this bypasses GPU memory limitations. And the way you do gradient accumulation is I will, so let's say I have a really bad GPU and I can only fit a batch size of eight, but I actually want to train with a batch size of 64. So I will feed in a batch of eight to my model. And the way that we've discussed it so far, once I compute the loss and do uh, compute the gradients with this batch of eight, I'll immediately adjust my parameters using my optimizer and then zero up these gradients and move on to the next batch. But in gradient accumulation, I will not actually adjust my parameters after this batch of eight. Instead, I will just store the gradient and I will move on to the next batch of eight. I'll accumulate these gradients until I reach my desired batch size of 64, which has actually taken me now eight different forward passes and backward passes through the GPU. And once I get to 64 examples, only then will I do an update to my parameters. So this is a hack, um, but it seems to be quite effective actually. So even if you have a huge GPU, you can do this to effectively simulate a much, much larger batch size. Um, okay, so the second thing that they did was remove the CLS pre-training task of next sentence prediction or segment prediction. So as a result, the CLS token gets no special treatment during pre-training. Um, I think it's never masked during pre-training, but otherwise it, there's nothing special about it. It's just something that's always part of the input during pre-training. Um, and in the Roberta paper, they find that if you get rid of this next sentence prediction task, your downstream performance is completely unaffected. So, um, yeah. And then finally, pre-train on more data. And I think I have the exact numbers here. Yeah, so where BERT was around 16 gigabytes of pre-training data, Roberta went to 160 gigabytes. And when you get to data at this scale, you're generally using data from um, the common crawl, which is 
just like a dump of the internet that is continuously updated every month. Um, there's also another data set created from crawling all web pages that are ever linked from Reddit. Um, apparently being linked from Reddit is a sign that maybe this web page is somewhat useful to some population of people. That's a little dubious, but uh, whatever. <laughs> um, and then finally, pre-train for longer. This means more total batches and epochs. Uh, they did it for 500k steps, where step is essentially used just like a batch. So, um, I mean, a step is different than a batch, and if you're doing something like gradient accumulation, um, you might do many batches before actually doing the step. But as you can see, the improvements here are all like in individually very minor, um, right? Like pre-train for more steps or uh, add more data. The architecture is exactly the same as BERT, right? It's still this giant transformer thing. Um, but all of these things make a big difference in the end. So, um, you know, it's hard to actually know this without doing a huge number of experiments where maybe you, you know, train the model with this batch size, you train another model with this batch size. Each of these runs might take days or weeks to complete depending on your resources. So only, you know, big labs can, can do this kind of uh, engineering work. All right, any questions on this? Yes. It might be what? It might create noise and have regularization. Oh, it might create noise. Yeah. yeah. And have a regularization kind of effect. So do, do we differentially do uh, I mean that was the prevailing thought even before papers like this came out in NLP. Um, it's only fairly recently that people learned that, oh well, really big batches are actually much better. Um, yeah, I'm not really sure as to the reasons behind this. Um, I imagine people have studied it, but I, I don't know. Obviously, the bigger the batch, the more stable the gradient, but that's only, after some point, that's probably not the main reason, um, right? Because you observe these gains by going to really, really big batch, batch sizes. So anyway, if I find anything, I'll, I'll let you know. Other questions? Okay, so let's uh, move on then to um, the transformer XL. I, I will spend less time on this. Um, the actual implementation is quite complicated, so I'll just give you the high-level idea of this, which is BERT and Roberta have uh, a fixed max sequence length. So for BERT, this is 512 tokens. And so the high, the high level idea of the transformer XL is what if we add a recurrent mechanism that connects adjacent segments? So let's say I use BERT to encode a block of 512 tokens. Then I use BERT to encode the block of 512 tokens from whatever document this is that immediately follows the previous block. Um, currently with BERT, those representations would be completely independent. So in this paper, they give you an idea of how can I use a recurrent connection to influence the representations of the second block of 512 with the um, representations derived from the first block. Um, that's generally the idea. Of course, I can't just naively do this because backprop into 1,024 tokens is not feasible. That's a whole reason why we have the max sequence limit. So one thing that they do is they essentially freeze the uh, first block, so there's 
no gradient flow to previous segments. So basically, I'll encode the first 512 tokens, and then I will cache the representations, the final layer representations. I might aggregate them somehow using a recurrent um, neural network, and then I'll feed them uh, or somehow condition the predictions of the next block of 512 tokens on this cached um, representation of the previous block. So this way, I'm freezing the representations from the previous block. Updates do not flow into that um, block. But this is a way to kind of connect uh, across multiple segments. You could imagine potentially making this um, recurrent connection go over many previous segments, not just the immediately one. Um, however, the implementation is complicated and practically uh, practical limit of context size for transformer XL is 900 tokens. So it didn't give you a huge boost after all because it is, you know, even caching these things is expensive, um, let alone adding a recurrent connection over them. So we'll talk later on in the semester about better methods to do this. Um, I wanted to move to the uh, different pre-training objectives because there is a very cheap one that works just as well as mask language modeling, it seems, um, but is more efficient to train. So remember that in mask language modeling, I'm replacing random words with mask tokens. In this Electra model, instead I'm going to replace random words with other random words potentially, and I'm going to ask the model to predict which words have been randomly replaced. So, for example, maybe I have a sentence like, Jane goes to baseball practice. And now I'm going to have some sort of perturbation function that randomly selects, say, 15% of the words, just like in vert. And so maybe we randomly select this word, um, baseball, and we replace it with some other word like tree. So now the sentence is Jane goes to tree practice, which is obviously a terrible sentence. Um, and now we're going to ask the model to do the following. So I'm going to put this. Jane goes to tree practice. As input to the model, it gets fed into a transformer. The architecture, again, is exactly the same as BERT, just a big transformer. As you can see, all of these models are essentially using the exact same um, model architecture. They're, they're just changing uh, various outside properties of the data or the training process, or in this case, the training objective. Anyway, in this case, I get some vectors, this output, and I get one vector that corresponds to tree. And so in, in BERT, we only applied this, uh, let me move this down. We only applied our mask language modeling objective to the tokens that were actually masked. So the other tokens got no training signal flowing through them. In Electra, this is not true. So in Electra, I have a single binary classifier. And it's supposed to predict, is this token real or fake? So I want to predict, say, one for real here. This one is real, goes. This one is real. Two, tree is fake, so predict zero. And one is real, so predict, uh, sorry, practice is real, so predict one. So in uh, contrast to BERT, in Electra, I'm getting a signal from every single token. Even a normal real token from the data is useful in this case, because uh, the model has to decide, is this uh, word does it make sense within this overall context or not for every single token. So of course if I form these fake words by randomly sampling tokens 
this is going to be a very easy task, right? The model doesn't have to learn much to know that tree is not uh, appropriate in this context. So um, they have some interesting ways on making this problem harder. So how do I decide which words to replace and with what? And so they have a generator model, which is essentially BERT. Essentially BERT. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to mask out some tokens at random. And then I'm going to ask BERT. So let's say in this case, I masked out baseball. I'm going to ask BERT what do you think is the most probable word that fills in this mask token? And maybe it gives a high probabil probability to baseball, but it probably also gives high probability to like tennis or soccer or other sports, right? Or dance or piano or whatever. So there's a lot of things that BERT assigns probability to, like non-trivial probability. And we could sample one of those words from BERT, right? Remember BERT is predicting for every mask word, a distribution over the entire vocabulary. So we can use BERT as a generator for this task of Electra, is this real or fake? So that's essentially how they do it. Does that make sense? All right, and so this, um, this formulation is more efficient. Um, you don't have to train for as many steps to get the downstream performance possibly because you're getting training signal from every token instead of just 15% of the tokens. Uh, it also means your softmax layer at the output is much smaller than it is in BERT. Although, since this model depends on BERT for the candidate generation, that's probably not um, a huge achievement. All right. Uh, wait, is it really only five? Oh, it's... <laughs> What happened to that clock? All right. <laughs> All right uh, so let's stop here. Um, and uh, we'll skip over Albert. Next class, we'll talk about text to text transfer.